Okay. Good evening, everyone. It is October 16, 2012. This is Forensic Interviewing of Children. And we are in Learning Module 3. This is the second week of Learning Module 3. And this Learning Module, I think, is real important. I think this is an area of child development that I wouldn't say is overlooked, but I... I not sure that people put enough emphasis on this aspect of child development. The other reason I spent two weeks on it is because I really am fascinated by kids and language, how language develops. I am a, you know, a student of linguistics or words. I, I'm ever vigilant when I read the newspaper and I hear people speak and, and self-vigilant when I say things incorrectly. Um, but I like words. I like how they're used. I like to listen to radio shows about them and podcasts. And I listen to NPR's Away With Words, which is a podcast of a radio show. It simply means you can download it from the internet and put it on your gadget. Um, but more than that, the tools that we use to communicate with children are words, right? So uh, we need to have a, an understanding of how they interpret our words, what their capabilities are, with regard to language, how they can express themselves with words, and what are some common errors that happen when we attempt to interview children, simply based upon words and language and English grammar and linguistics. Now, I hated it in high school and detested it in college. Uh, what, I, what I mean is English grammar. But nevertheless, I have a different perspective now. While I didn't like it then, I, I, I like thinking about words and language now. And of course, we're thinking about it much differently than we did when we were in school. Although, some of the things I'm going to mention today involve English grammar. And they're simple aspects of English grammar, but they're important if you want to be a forensic interviewer. And if you want to talk to kids and get reliable information. And we need to leverage our potential to get good information and reliable information, and lots of it when, when we are in an interview room with a child. And whatever it is, it's the little things, you know, that, that help. So whatever it is, we need to do. And some things don't cost a nickel, and they're quite easy to do. And we'll look at some of them here. Look, when, that, when you're standing across from a kid who's been brutalized, when you're standing across from a kid who's been highly traumatized, when you're standing or sitting across from a child who has a soft-spoken personality, who is shy and introverted, plus traumatized, uh, who's being asked to talk about human sexuality to a stranger. It's hard enough. There are certain things about their past we can never change. They are who they are. Their personality is what it is. Their abusive experience, their trauma is what it is. And that has an impact. And it's going to make it difficult. It's going to make it difficult for us to communicate with them. But there are some things within our control. We can control what we wear. We can control how we address the children, the kind of voice that we use, right? our tone. We can control the kinds of questions that we ask. That's something we have control over. It's hard enough to get reliable, large amounts of good information from small children. We might as well address and be mindful of the things that we can take ownership of and control and language and how we speak to kids is one thing that we can take control of. And it takes practice to develop these skills unconsciously. And even today I see people who are trained forensic, forensic interviewers uh, make errors that could be remedied uh, if they were more mindful of the language that they use. A couple of them are Small errors, small things, but things that I like and that are important to me and I think um, are easy to apply if you make it your business to do so. Now, I know that you watch this video, my narrated PowerPoint online at your convenience over the last seven days. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to go over it with you again and maybe we'll open up the floor and maybe take a few questions and, and work work on it that way. Um, but, you know, what I have to say is not going to be much different from what you heard on that narration. Uh, but I'll try to mix it up a bit. And Ann Walker, the woman who said, 
even very young children can tell us what they know if we ask them the right questions in the right way. Uh, Ann Walker is a linguist from Georgetown University, and, and some of the chapters from her book were among your readings. Those are the clickable PDFs that were in learning unit three. But Walker spent most of her career as a linguist and got into forensics. Um, I would imagine it was probably the middle of her career, but she didn't start out with an interest in the language of children or children in linguistics, but eventually was asked by the American Bar Association and she wrote that handbook for questioning children because she used to do lectures around the country. I'm not sure where she is or what she's up to. I haven't seen her professionally in a while. But a lot of her work is considered the standard in our field, that is forensic interview. A lot of her work is respected and continues to endure despite the fact that her handbook, I think, was published in 99. And if you look at that quote, it kind of makes the point that I was suggesting a moment ago, that this is not about the kid, it's about us, right? The, the focus of this quote is about us asking the right questions in the right way. And that's something we can control. Now, in order to be a competent speaker, in order to be good at speaking, kids have to have a couple of things. Obviously, they need words, vocabulary, and grammar, but they also need experience with how to use it. And language develops in a real-life context. It doesn't develop simply by children mimicking or parroting words. It's unconscious, it happens in stages, and adults can help, but you really can't teach language. The acquisition of language requires an immersive context. And life is immersive, right? When you, when you live in a house and you ask uh, a child uh, to sit up straight or they make a comment to you about they want a glass of milk, it happens in the kitchen. It happens in a real-life context. There's the milk, there's the refrigerator, there's the countertop, there's mommy, there's the child. So all of these things create a real-life context around the act of milk, mama, milk the reaching of the hand, mama may respond some way, you had too much milk, no more milk, you're going to get a bellyache. Whatever mom might say to that child doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in a real-world context and an environment that helps facilitate the acquisition of language. And I think I talk about the, the movie on the video, narrated PowerPoint, Splash, where a mermaid washes on the shore and she watches television programming, you know, and after 10 days she's able to speak English. It doesn't work that way. And if you really want to learn a language, you certainly can use computer software or, or play compact discs in your car or take a class at the community college. But the best way to learn Spanish is to move to Madrid for six months. You'll learn Spanish, rest assured. Stay there for a year, you'll learn it even better. And, and that's in part because of the immersive aspect of your existence there, right? You need it to survive. Go to the bathroom to eat, to pay for things. You get to the library, right? So uh, language, even for adults who want to learn a second language, is about hearing the words and interacting in that language in a real-life context. Same thing with kids. Any questions or observations? Preschoolers are very literal, and we need to know that. This is important for forensic interviewers, because to them, a house is a house, and an apartment is an apartment, right? And a, a trailer or the projects or whatever they are to them. Okay, that, that's something that's relevant to some kids. So they may not, they may say that they don't live in a house, or they don't live in an apartment. And because they can be so literal, and because we don't follow up on that, we may undermine that kid's credibility. So you 
really need to follow up on these things. But, you know, to a child who maybe lives in the inner city, you know, at times, although a lot of the housing is changing, um, you know, kids would refer to your living space as the projects. And you're talking apartments, and they're talking projects, and, you know, there's a miscommunication. And then you think that, what do you mean? She said she didn't live in the apartments. I, that's where I got her from. And what's the matter? She's got to watch this one. She's not accurate. Well, she is accurate. The mistake's on our part. And sometimes it's the little things. You saw the video clip of Clinton. Clinton. When Giselle was interviewing Clinton, there was confusion over what he wore under his pants, right? To him, underwears were probably briefs. Men's brief underwears. Underwear. Boxers were something else. Now, we all know and are able to do the breakdown laugh, like boxers and briefs and boxer briefs and, and all the women's stuff, which there's probably 11 different varieties of panties. They all fit under the word underwear, right? But to him, underwear was something, might even been a third category in his mind, in his family, right? Underwears are one thing, boxers are something else, briefs or underpants or something else. And why Clinton's interview is so important is it may seem like no big deal, especially in the world of child sexual abuse investigations. If he had boxers on, and this is why we recommend that forensic interviews, if you're going to do multiple sessions, it's the same interviewer. Because when you switch interviewers, you run the risk of one interviewer using a little bit different language than the original interview used, you, interviewer used. Even the same interviewer can use different kinds of questions and ask the same thing in a different way in a second interview. There's always that peril. But certainly with different interviewers, there is a higher risk that somebody will approach a question a different way. And to draft off of the Clinton example, if Clinton was interviewed by the guidance counselor at school, or the school nurse, and we have that report, and that report says that he reported that his uncle pulled down his pants and rubbed his penis on top of his underwear. Now, he might have said to the nurse, yeah, you know, Uncle Gerard pulled my pants down, but what happened next? And he, he rubbed my thinking. He rubbed my thinking. What were you wearing? I was wearing my boxers. Where was his hand? It was on top of my boxers. What did he do? He rubbed it up and down on top of my boxers. When the interviewer writes the report, she writes, child was fondled on penis on top of clothing. Reports that Uncle Gerard put his hand under his sweats on top of his underwear and rubbed his penis. Is that a true characterization of what the boy said? Yes. Is it a verbatim quote of what the boy said? No. Now, he calls them boxers. Imagine Giselle's interview him, interviewing him an hour later, a day later, it doesn't matter. And she starts questioning him about what he was wearing. Very open-ended, very neutral, very objective. What happened next, Clinton? Then Uncle Gerard put his hand into my sweatpants. Were, were you wearing uh, underwear? Uh-uh. You weren't wearing any underwear, Clinton? No. Well, I'm, I heard that you talked to Nurse Jones about this. Did you talk to Nurse Jones about this? Uh-uh. Did you tell Nurse Jones that you were rubbed on top of your underwear? No. Okay, we need to talk about that more later. Tell me what happened next. Well, then he was rubbing my thing. Oh, wait a minute now. You see what I'm talking about here? Clinton looks like he's wrong, mistaken, lying, confused, Immature. I don't know why, but he don't look credible. He don't look straight ahead. I don't know what's going on here. And it's because his word is different than Giselle's word and than our word. So they're very literal or they're very specific about certain aspects of their existence. And that can cause a problem now and then. So how would you approach that? Let's say you're Giselle. And before you move on, 
before you move on, he says, you know, he put his hand under my sweat to start to rub me. Was that on top of your underwear? No. Were you wearing underwear? I didn't have no underwear on. Now you're Giselle. What would you ask next? He got, you know the report says he was rubbed on the underwear. Right? You, you want, you want, listen, in lawyering and forensic interviewing, where there's a conflict, where things don't add up, you don't leave them dangling there. We say you must reconcile the conflict. That means we got to figure out what happened here, why you got a conflict, how to fix that. Or maybe it is unfixable. Maybe someone wrote it down wrong in the past. Right? Or maybe the nurse uh, confused her case with another case. Um, but more often than not, it's not that. It's something that's explicable. So what would you what would you ask next? Okay. Okay. Probably ask the, the child to just sort of stop and say, well, then why don't you tell me what happened, okay? Because if you, because at first I was thinking to say, like, you know, tell me what you told Nurse Joan, but that's not really what you want to know. You want to know what actually happened. Exactly. So just, just, just say, okay, so start at the beginning. You tell me what happened. And... By doing that, you think maybe he'll express that uh, he had some underwear on, or different underwear on, or, or he'll, he'll reconcile that simply by giving a narrative uh, to your question. Maybe. Go ahead. Can you ask him if there was any sweatpants? Yes, that would be good. Well, either way works for me. This way is open-ended. Okay, well, tell me everything that happened when he put his hand under your sweatpants. The hope is that it'll go... Well, then he began to rub my boxers, and then he tingled a little bit, and, and I told him to stop, but he wouldn't. And then you go, oh, boxer, you know. So maybe it'll come out that way, and that's as open-ended as I, I get. But it's not, it's not wrong if you have different information when you're interviewing that child to say, before you jump to, well, Nurse Jones said you were rubbed on top of your underwear. I wouldn't go there. I would do what you just said. Well, Clinton. Do you wear, I think Giselle asked him something like that, eventually, or at the beginning, do you wear something under your sweats? Yeah. What do you wear under your sweats? Boxers. Were you, what were you wearing that day under your sweats? Or were you wearing something that day under your sweats? Yeah. Boxers. Tell me what happened next. Now, many students have found Giselle's interview a little awkward because in an effort to remain neutral, objective, and non-leading or suggestive, instead of saying what many interviewers are tempted to do, where your clothes on or off, and that's a bad question. If you're going to ask that question, I will teach you later. I'll give you a preview now. That's a forced choice question. It's an either or. You know, were they on or off? Was the car running, driving fast or slow? It doesn't allow for other possibilities. So anytime he asked a multiple choice, he ended with, or something else. Were your clothes on or off or something else? Was the light on or off or something else? Was mommy crying in her room or something else? That's not the one. In any event, Giselle doesn't want to ask a multiple choice question, certainly not right away. I mean, you, you, your multiple choice question is a, is a form of direct questioning. And it's suggestive in the sense that it has options. Although it has an open-ended option at the end or something else, you know, it's not as good as what happened next, right? Or tell me what he did next. Or tell me what happened when you put his hand under your sweats. That's already been testified to. Or he's already made a statement about that. Giselle was attempting to be neutral and objective and say, well, and I don't know what her lead was, but well, when Uncle Gerard took you in the room and was touching you on the bed, how were your clothes? And she's trying to get him to tell you what state of were his clothes in. Where were they? What was happening with his clothes? Without saying, were they on or off? You know, remember... These kids don't know that human sexuality involves taking people's clothes off and getting, touching their body parts and things. So we don't even want to suggest that. Once we introduce into the equation, 
clothes might have been on or off. You know, we're sexualizing something the kid said. You're right over there? What happened? <laughs> the screen just Oh, yeah, right. It's okay. It's good there. <laughs> so couldn't you say earlier in the interview, set it up like what were you wearing that day and then like later on say what, where was your blue t-shirt or something you know what I mean like yeah look that, that's kind of a clunky way to do it she's since remedied that um, it's not bad it's just confusing and you, when you watch that video you can see a lot of confusion ensue you know a lot of confusion arose from that statement but yeah what were you wearing go ahead from personal experience Well, you know, I don't know how. What's that? It's a frequent thing. Yeah, there's these theories of primacy and recency, and I'm not sure how that works with three-year-old preschoolers and what the research says on that. And um, you know, clearly, a multiple-choice question isn't ideal, and the last part of our recommendations or something else. So if they say or something else, we're going to have to say, tell me about a lot, what happened, you know. So, And we really don't interview too many three-year-olds because they're just not able to give a narrative. Uh, um, it happens. They can be interviewed, but they're not interviewed in the sense that you interview any other witness. They're interviewed for whatever you can pluck out of what they say and corroborate with compelling evidence. So if they go, daddy, daddy, blood, mommy and daddy, yell, yell, blood, blood. Well, that's, that's not a witness, you're not going to bring that into court by itself, but if there's a domestic violence case and somebody died and they couldn't find the body and the neighbors go, I heard people fighting, then the, those unhinged utterances of the child may be admissible. Um, so little three-year-olds are just real different. Um, but, you know, when you have an open end at the end and you know, I don't know what the research, you know, I'd have to look into that. I don't know what research is about eight-year-olds and that, you know, I mean, that's an observation you made from experience, and they tend to pick the last thing. And, um, and again, that's a personal preference question. Um, there's nothing riding on it. It's, it's not about whether dad or somebody did something, so I'm not sure how it all intersects. Um, but the point here is clothing questions are a big part of physical abuse, and especially sexual abuse. So we need to ask questions about clothing. And if we ask whether clothes were on and off, that, I'm saying to you that that injects sexuality into Not sexuality, but it injects the suggestion that somebody's clothes had to be on or off. And one of the things that we like about little kids making statements is that they're often beyond their years. The assumption is that they don't know anything about human sexuality. And if dad was tickling their wiener and their clothes were on, you know, that might be one thing. It might not even be criminal. The kid might be, say, tickling my wiener when he was tickling his hip or his tire. Or there may be other plausible explanations for that child to make that statement. Once the clothes come off, we're in sexual abuse territory. You see? And we have to be careful we don't introduce the idea of clothes ever being off even though it's number one thing on our mind, because it helps clarify what the hell we got here, right? Does that make sense? So we need to, even with the open-ended back end, we need to avoid asking where the clothes are on or off. Well, first of all, we never should ask that ever again. We need to avoid asking where the clothes are on or off or something else. Um, and there are other ways to get there without asking that question. Go ahead. Maybe, maybe. Them into yeah, but I wouldn't ask them what were you wearing that day. Uh, uh, this question would come up in context. So the, the assumption is that they somehow we got into the... And then Uncle, Uncle Gerard I mean, took, took me in the shed. Well, what happened next? 
told me to sit on the bench. What happened next? And then we play a game. What game? The shed game. I've never played the shed game. How do you do that? Well, he, he, he touches my wiener. What did he use to touch your wiener? Huh? What part of his body did he use to touch your wiener? His hand. That's true, but I, I asked him, that's true, but I asked him, what did he use to touch your wiener? And he said, I don't know, or I, I asked him as a follow-up to a non-response. Remember, I said, what did he touch your wiener with? I don't know. What part of his body did he touch your wiener with? It is, it is suggested, there's no doubt about it, but we know there was a touch. Could you, would you say, did he use a part of his body? That you could do that. You could do that. That's better. But that's not the point I'm trying to make okay. here. That's okay. I, I can't go off the top of my head and think of perfectly neutral. You know, you need yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my point, <coughs> you're correct. My point here is what did he touch your body with? Let's assume he says his hand. I'll get it. What I just said. His hand. What happened next? I don't know. He put his hand there. Where were your clothes? Or what were you wearing when he put his hand there? Where were your clothes when he put his hand there? You're going to have to have a discussion about clothes. So we can't go, we shouldn't introduce the topic. Oh, we might as well walk out of the room, man. We shouldn't say anything. Go ahead. You tell me what happened. That's it. You're bored. You can't tell me. See you later. So, you know, there, there's... The old metaphor is the funnel. You start out wide with open-ended questions, and you move more narrow. And that's kind of what I was trying to do before. Did he, what did he touch you with? I don't know. Did he touch you with? I mean, it's the, did, and, and he did, did you, but what part of his body did he touch you with? So you get more focused and more narrow, and, and a little bit more uh, information is in the question. I hate to pull it suggested, but it's, it's um, mildly leading, in a way. But little kids need cueing. We'll see that. I don't know if it's this lecture or the next one, maybe suggestibility. Yeah, I think suggestibility. We'll talk about that. They need cueing. It's a fact of life. And we're not going to throw kids, you know, away and not investigate their cases simply because they need a little help remembering stuff. But the key is to follow up a direct question with an open-ended question. And a few leading questions, a few suggestive questions. Don't destroy an interview. And little kids need chewing. C U E I N G. Anyway, what I'm asking, or what I'm offering, or suggesting to you is, is that we ask clothing questions in context. Well, you're right. We said, hi, what's your name? I'm Danielle. How old are you? I'm seven. Okay, who do you live with? Blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, my uncle Gerardo touched me. What were you wearing that day? I don't think that's the right time to, like, you may get an answer, you're right. I mean, things that you might not have had back then, I mean, it almost asks for speculation from the kids. Because you're not always, they want to live up to our expectations. And they may give us an answer when they, <coughs> when they think they were aware of it. So I, wor I worry about those kind of questions. Because I've noticed over the years, you almost always get an answer. You know, I was wearing my Power Puffs shirt and my blue jeans. And, I, and I'm watching a video on this time. I actually could remember that. I, I'll never know. Uh, but I'm always skeptical of those kind of statements by little kids about something that happened two or three years ago that they remember exactly what they were wearing. But we do, and sometimes they might. But I think in my experience from watching hundreds of videos over the years that we get too many affirmative answers to that. Where they were probably should be, I don't remember. Or I think I was wearing my pajamas. or I always wear pajamas and you know, sweats and a t-shirt to bed, that would be a more plausible response to me rather than I was wearing very specific No, I mean like, checklist. like that, but would they say, like, oh, I was wearing whatever, like, little things to me, like, they wear it every day, so they're not going to sit there and say, yeah, I had it on underneath my pajamas, because it's natural to them. That's right. You know what I mean? That's why, but we want to start out, we want to start out broadly. And I think, going back to the shed, um, what were you wearing when Uncle Gerard took you to the shed game? Remember, you can 
say whatever the kid has already said. That's not suggestive. In fact, it helps orient the kid to what the hell you're asking for. You know, these what happened next, and tell me more about that. I mean, you know, that calls for a narrative. That's always best. Um, but narrative just statements, you don't get a lot of information from small kids. So, tell me about your clothes when Uncle Gerard was touching you in the shed. I don't know. So, where were your clothes when his hand was near your wiener? On my body. When he had his hand on your wiener and was tickling it, where were your clothes then? Well, you know, he might say he pulled them down a little bit, he put his hand under mine. How did his hand, did it touch the skin on your wiener or your clothes or something else? That's a common question we ask. Listen, you're going to ask three or four questions, but we can't spend all day tap dancing around this issue of clothes just to, you know, be worried about the naysayers and the people who attack forensic interviews of kids because one aspect of it might be mildly leading. And if you have to say, well, where, where were his hands? How did he, how, you said he touched your wiener. How did he touch your wiener? Tell me more about he touched your wiener. And if you don't want to, if you, it's not getting the answer, say, listen, well, it were his hands on your clothes. Or actually, a better one would be kind of what Giselle said. Do you wear something under your pants? Yeah, I wear my underpants. Well, where were his hands? He <coughs> put his hands on your wiener. You know, see whether, you know, were they on your underpants, on your skin, on top of your sweats, or something else? And look, he introduced the concept of the hand on the wiener here. We're not giving him too much of a suggestion by asking about the context of the touching. And to not do it, you know, leaves us vulnerable to arguments that we didn't have precision. So you attempt to get precision with regard to the touchings. More often than not, and again, this is my anecdotal experience, they respond to those questions. Not the preschoolers, they may be a little more challenging, but most kids five and above, they'll say, well, he pulled them down, they were kind of down, they were at my knees, he stuck his hand in my sweats. I mean, it's not too challenging with five and above. You've got to be extra careful with the little ones. Um, but nevertheless, it's all about perception, too, even with the older kids. You want to get in a habit of asking questions the same way. There are certain kinds of questions that happen over and over again in forensic interviewing. Forensic interviewing. And one of them, one question set is queries about clothing. Because it's so important to what we're doing, right? So you'll see this from time to time. So it's very helpful you know, to have the same process that you go through all the time, no matter what the age of the kid is. It's reinforcing for you, right, if you do it the same way all the time. And it's tried and true, especially if it's a non-suggestive sequence. Little kids, including preschoolers, this even applies to five, six, and seven-year-olds, right up to about seven. Abstractions are very difficult to comprehend for kids. Truth, lie, uh, these kinds of words are very difficult for small children. Pronouns is something that we can control, okay? Uh, I think Grafam Walker, Ann Walker, uh, in Handbook for Questioning Children, calls them indexicals. I like to refer to them as placeholders, because that's what they are. They're word substitutes. They're annoyingly ambiguous. And for every pronoun, you can substitute what? The proper noun. The name, the word, the thing. Right? What's a pronoun? A substitute for a noun. What's a noun? A person, place, or thing. Is that what we learned years ago? So there's always a person, place, or thing that you can move the pronoun out of the way and put the person, place, or thing there. Persons, places, and things are more precise than pronouns. Especially when you have multiple pronouns. See, pronouns require that the reader or the listener refer back to something that happened in the past and connect it up. Usually it happens effortlessly and easily. 
because of the juxtaposition of the pronoun with the proper noun. Joe got his new car yesterday, but crashed it into a pole. We don't have to struggle to figure out what the it relates to. If we said the car, it would be more precise, but sometimes it can get a little goofy. Joe got his new car yesterday and crashed the car into the pole. That's not as goofy as some of these statements could be if you replace the pronoun in this, within the single sentence. But we know that the word it refers back to the car. But sometimes you have sentences or questions that have dual subjects and then a pronoun at the end. Now you got problems. Joe washed his car on Saturday morning and changed the oil on his motorcycle. Later in the afternoon, he crashed it into a telephone pole. That's confusing for me. <laughs> yeah, because I washed my car and I changed the oil on a motorcycle, and then I tell you about something, an it, that crashed into a pole. Now, some people would argue, well, the it refers to the last thing in the prior sentence, so it's the motorcycle. That's the rule of grammar. Well, kids don't get that. I don't even know if that's true. But if it is, that may not be the intent of the speaker. Maybe the speaker don't follow the rules. Or maybe the child's too young to get that. Maybe in the child's mind, the thing that's more distinctive, the thing that stands out the most, is that big old car getting scrubbed. And maybe they, you know, you, you don't really... Uh, You more often hear about cars crashing into poles than motorcycles. As a person who has both, you know, the motorcycle is kind of hard to crash into the pole. I guess you could. You can have a collision with a pole. A pole could get in your way, but the car kind of crashes into it, wraps around it. The motorcycle, um, it would hit it. It just, you hear more about, I think, cars colliding with poles than motorcycles. Who knows? But people will, people will analyze that however they want to. It's, it's unclear. Ambiguous. Now, in the world of child abuse investigations, we often ask questions about people, places, and things. And we often use words, substitutes. The thing is, you can be more clear, and it doesn't cost the nickel simply by putting the proper name in there. It's easy to do, and it's clear for the kids. We got enough. We got enough to worry about without worrying about whether or what they mean um, or what they understand by our use of pronouns. Kids are confused by negatives too. We'll look at that more closely in a second. Multiple part questions or what we call compound questions or compound complex questions. Any questions that have multiple parts that can be broken down into single questions. They're a problem for kids. Keep it simple. Now, this is problematic for a couple of reasons. The first example. It's a compound question. It has multiple parts. So if the child answered yes, are we any further along in our interview than before we asked the question? No, we've got to ask another question to find out what the hell they meant. So that's a bad question. We hope that a question we ask gets a response that answers what we're interested in. This question, whatever the response is, especially if it's a one-word response, doesn't further the interview. It's a compound question. It has multiple parts. Do you recall going to the hospital, and can you tell me why? There are two other problematic aspects of that question that are unrelated to its compound nature or its two-part nature. Do you recall that? Avoid do you recall. Grafam Walker calls these DUR questions. And forensic interviewers and adults who interview kids 
for some reason, we like to say those kinds of things. I find myself saying those kinds of things when I kind of practice with my son. When I'm interested in something he did, I always try to use my friends and interviewing skills. And not in a very, you know, sophisticated way. Just kind of use the things I teach when I ask him stuff. I try to avoid anyone and use someone. And there's other things. We didn't get to that yet. But there's other things I might do. But still, I find myself saying to him, do you remember if you're going to go on the school trip next year? Do you remember if the teacher told you? These DUR questions. Do you recall, do you remember, and can you tell me? Rafam Walker recommends against them. I strongly recommend against them. They're what we call surplusage. It's a legal word for unnecessary. Valueless, adds nothing to the equation. Every question you ask that begins with the preamble, do you remember, can you tell me, okay. do you recall, I can chop off that section of the question and it will be a better question. It will be the same question but better. There isn't a question in all of the English language you can think of that that observation doesn't hold true. Every time you ask a question that begins with any of these DURs, if you delete that, the question still works, and it works better. Especially since kids, kids are in, kids are very avoidant when they're in a forensic interview. They don't want to be there. You're asking them to inform on their uncle, their father, their sister, their brother, their mother, whomever, their teacher, their coach, their priest. You're asking them to inform on somebody that they love and trust. You're asking them to betray somebody. So they're not interested in being here. They're not interested in you getting, giving them the answers. You're also asking them to give information about human sexuality, which is not the nicest thing in the world to talk about to strangers. You're also asking to, them to get into their most personal aspects of their victimization, shameful acts for which they feel to blame. I mean, here's, as we know, I overemphasize this often, there are dozens of reasons why these kids don't want to tell us what happened. That's why we have a course called Forensic Interview with Children. Because you know, not only is their immaturity a problem, their lack of development a problem, there's all this psychology that impedes getting information. So if you've got an avoided subject, if you have an avoided child or interviewee, why ask them, can you tell me, or do you remember? Why do I say that? Why is, do you remember uh, a problem if you have an avoidant interview? Yes, yeah, it gives them an easy out, right? It's giving them an opportunity to just bail without really buying. Memory is so vague and amorphous, right? Or, you know, I, kind of remember. I don't remember everything of it. No, it's not very kind. No, I don't remember. So it's an easy out for the child. All manifestations of those DURs can be easy out for the child who are inherently avoidant in this context. Wouldn't it also be confusing to say, like, um, and can you tell me why? Because because of just the sheer fact that somebody might have said, don't tell anybody, you know, they might be thinking, you're at, can you tell me? No, I can't. I mean, well, yes. Yeah. That, that might be, the can you tell me might be, I'm not allowed to tell you whatever, but I think we're, yes, to tell me why, maybe they're supposed to keep it a secret or whatever, but that might be a reason. And that's part two of that, that why that question is banned. That right. do you recall aspect at the beginning, I right. forgot about that, at the end, you're correct, that part. There's, the reason why that's a problem, again, this is about multiple part questions, but it's got two other funky aspects. DUR, and then tell me why. Children have a hard time understanding people's motivations. Okay, it's not until we get older that we're able to infer people's motivations. We never really know. Even for an adult, uh, you know, can you tell me why Jillian likes coffee so much? I can guess. I mean, every, every time we ask a question about someone else's motivation, 
We're asking people to speculate. So that's a problem. So this, this question is about why did she go to the hospital? You know, she needs to speculate about why mom took her there or whatever. Now, I know what to drive at because like, that's my pee pee. I got that. But on some levels, it can be confusing. On some levels, it asks for, to that child, it might ask for mom's mom. I don't know. I didn't want to go to the hospital. Mom, I don't know why mommy took me there. It was a touching. Why should she go to the doctor? You know, so it's asking that child to speculate, perhaps, about a third person's motivation, mom's, or whoever took her to the hospital. Or her own motivation. They don't even know what motivates them. You know, why'd you break the lip? I don't know. Now, is there a reason you went in Billy's room? Did he grab? I don't know. Put in there. I mean, they don't even know what motivates themselves. We're going to get more into why questions in a minute, but that's one aspect of why. There are other kind of why questions that are problematic, but that's one aspect of why uh, that's problematic in a different way. And it requires that the kid analyze human motivation. That's a higher cognitive function. That's a fancy way of saying they haven't been on the planet long enough to figure out why people do stuff. You know, if you jog across the crosswalk, I'm going to infer, and probably be right 99 out of 100 times, that you were trying to beat a car that was coming. Well, you quickly and hurriedly run across the crosswalk. Why did Jillian hurriedly run across? Because there was a car coming. I guess. Maybe she was late for class. Um, so why is a problem? Do you recall is a problem? Do you remember is a problem? Can you tell me is a problem? Every one of those questions, if you lop it off, can you tell me what happened to the shed? Tell me what happened to the shed. Do you remember what the bad man was wearing? What was the bad man wearing? Assuming they called him a bad man. Tell me what the guy was wearing. Do you remember if he had facial hair? Tell me what his face looked like. Do you remember if he had long hair or short hair or something else? Tell me what his hair looked like. Okay? Little kids have a very rigid view of agency, even bigger kids. And by agency, we're talking about the person who's doing something. Agency refers to the person who's doing something. The agent. In a sentence where agency is involved, we're using the term agency as a conjugation of the word agent. Agent is a person who did something. An agent for change. In that kind of context, we're using the word agency or agent. So, in this classic example, and I think I have a video of it. I'm going to play it. I think I have a different version of this. But in this classic example, the so-called cross-examination went something like this. And I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's often repeated by prosecutors and trainers. Um, Uncle Billy molested Gerard and, and he made Gerard fillet him. So Gerard had to put his mouth on Uncle Billy's penis. And on direct examination by the prosecutor during the trial the prosecutor asked a bunch of questions and Gerardo told how he mouth was on Uncle Billy's penis and all this stuff happened. This act of oral sex happened. On cross-examination, the defense lawyer says, well, Gerard, I want to talk to you about when you put your mouth on Uncle Billy's penis the first time. I, I never put my mouth on Uncle Billy's penis. The defense lawyer is like, whatever. You know. No, no, remember when Mr. Del Russo was questioning you? You told us how you, when you were in the shed... You put your mouth on Uncle Billy's penis. I never put my mouth on Uncle Billy's penis. You didn't put your mouth on Uncle Billy's penis in the shed? No. So the story goes, on redirect, when the prosecutor has an opportunity to clear up things or ask questions, he tells Uncle, he tells Gerardo, oh, what about that? The lawyer asked you nine different ways. He said, you never put your mouth on Uncle Billy's penis. The boy says, I didn't. He put his penis in my mouth. So that's a form of being literal. That's also about agency. Who the doer is. D-O-E-R. That's the way I say it. Who the agent is. There's a variety of reasons why Gerardo might want this to be crystal clear. One might be child development. That's just the way children see the world. It's, it's very literal. They're very precise when it comes to who's doing something. 
And that is an aspect of children's linguistic development. But it also might be like, I didn't want to do it. You know, I'm not to blame. I, I, I didn't do that. You know, I wasn't the, the person. He was the person. So there may be an aspect of that in it as well, where the child is explaining that uh, this is not something I was into. It wasn't consensual. Because the way that the defense lawyer posed the question, it appears as though he was, did an affirmative act. And that is an affirmative act that Gerardo wants the world to know he wouldn't do. And that's not the way it went down, and he's not into that, so to speak. Now, I think I have a video. Do I have a video about the girl in the robe? Did you see that? Let me see. Yeah. Yes, children and agency. Oh. I know, I'm just trying to. All right, good. The ad helps me because now I can. Oh, no, no. see where the audio is. attention uh, to the language here. I'll lower the... It's a little loud. Children have a very rigid view of gay. That is, they are very specific about who the person is that's engaging in action. The person is doing something. You may remember the little boy who said, I didn't put my mouth on Uncle Billy's penis. He put his penis in my mouth. Similarly, the little girl in this video has a very rigid view of who the person is that's engaging in the action. And it's not her, it's someone else. And then, um, you went and sat on his lap and then he said to you, can you keep a secret? Okay, and you said, yeah. And then what happened after that? Did he put my hand under the when he grabbed her hand, with what part of his body did he grab her hand with? With his, with his, um, with his hand. With his hand. And then you said he put it under his robe? Did he have anything on under his robe? No. No? Okay, so so where did he put your hand? On his private. On his private? Okay, this part you call his private? Okay. So what happened if you put your hand on his private? Oh. 
So tell me about the agency issue in that video clip. Why is that a good illustration of agency? What, what happened there? What did the interviewer say and what did the child say that illustrates what I just said about agency a moment ago with Uncle Billy? Well, she said that we're all put our hand on his heart. Who's she? She mm -hmm. used the pronoun. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. The interviewer. Very good. Um, said the little girl put her hands on the, the man's heart. The little girl corrected her and said, no, he took my hand and he put it on. I didn't do it. Did I say Excellent. That's exactly it. And it's about two-thirds of the way through. And Fran established what was happening through a series of questions. We, the girl said he took my hand and put it on all that. And then Fran was just cueing her. Well, when you put your hand on his private, that was her preamble, introductory phrase to some other question. And she's like, whoa, no, 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 hold on. I didn't put my hand on his private. He took my hand and put it on his private. And again, that's, you know, an adult might listen to that and then correct it later, because it is kind of an important distinction, even for adults, I think. But nevertheless, um, it was real important to this child. And she interrupted Francis. Hold on, time out. That's not the way it went down. It's essentially what she's saying. And uh, in part, it's because of the rigid view of agency. It, it, it's that way, it's that child's effort to make it clear who the agent is, who the doer is. But the other thing I think that's happening there is what? One is it's about agency, but it's also about what? Why would the child be so quick and firm and emphatic in her correction of Fran? What other forces are at work here that might be motivating her quick and emphatic correction? I just can't hear you. She knew what was wrong. Exactly. And, and she knew it was wrong. She didn't want to be the person who was the doer because it's something that's wrong. And she didn't want to be perceived as the person who initiated it. And we, we call that more generally uh, complicity. She didn't want to appear complicit. This wasn't her saying, her idea. She wasn't complicit in this. It wasn't consensual. Um, and um, I think there's that psychological issue here as well. And she wants to make it clear. But again, these are the kinds of blocks and problems and obstacles that we meet, we encounter all the time with interviewing kids. And they all have their root in language, in the words, and how we express the question, right? Now, the next thing, and this is kind of related to the agency. They do best with subject verb, object, sentence construction. And I think we talk about that over here as well. Kids may have trouble with the passive voice. Okay? Mary was rubbed by John. That's the passive voice. Let's go back. Kids do best with subject, verb, object, sentence construction. And a grammarian might say, children do best when you question them in the active voice. That's the fancy English grammar expression of subject, verb, object. The active voice. The active voice versus the passive voice. And it's, it's kind of easy to understand the distinction if you look at it this way. In the active voice construction, the doer, the person doing something, the agent, is at the beginning of the sentence. And the thing upon which the doer or the agent is acting upon, the object, is at the end of the sentence. That's the active voice. Sadly, you can take almost every active voice construction and flip it around and turn it into the passive voice. The passive voice is clunky and unclear in writing and in interview. 
we want to discourage the passive voice. And for whatever reasons, we humans, and we writers, when we write, we're always kind of biased towards the passive voice. You'd be surprised how often, I guarantee it's in your writing, and all the detectives' writings that I read in my own writings, I see the passive voice all the time. If you use Word, the software program, you can get a little green squiggly line under your grammar when it doesn't meet their standards. And one that I get flagged on a lot is the passive voice. The suspect's house was searched by the detectives from Special Victims. After the search warrants were signed, the suspect's house was thoroughly searched by detectives. Passive voice. How can we make that the active voice? Thoroughly, thoroughly searched in there. Yeah. Flip it around. The detectives are the searchers. They're at the end of my sentence. Now, you know, that might make for awkward prose. It might not be the best way to write a report. It may be inelegant if you are a writer or a, someone who has to file reports or write something to your supervisor. And it might be slightly confusing to adults, but for little kids, it can be thoroughly confusing. And the reason is, is because they're beginning... They're just beginning to appreciate sentence construction and language and words. And they have certain expectations when they're preschoolers, or even six and seven, or eight. They have certain expectations, and their expectations are that the person who's doing something is at the beginning of the sentence. And we socialize them that way. Because when we read them books and they watch programming, Children's writers, appropriately so, always write in the active voice. If they don't, they probably won't be too successful. The famous yarn isn't uh, the pail of water was fetched by Jack and Jill. The hill they went to tumbling down. You know, there at the beginning, when you're reading children's books or stories. Invariably, it's in the active voice with simple, short, subject, verb, object sentences. So when you start to mix things up to a little kid, you're asking for problems and you're creating confusion. Okay? John rubbed Mary. That's the subject, verb, object, construction. The passive construction is Mary was rubbed by John. If kids are socialized to expect that the doers at the beginning of the sentence, tell me how to interpret this response. You have the referral from the Division of Youth and Family Services. The referral is the short summary of what the kids said. The kids said, Daniela said that when she was in the basement, okay, this kid, John, who lives around the corner, was touching all the little girls. And John, John rubbed Daniela, her, the girl, the interview. John rubbed her, and he rubbed Mary, and he rubbed Gabriella. You got the facts. You got the report. You know what the allegation is. Daniela reports that John rubbed her, Gabriella, and Mary. So now you're interviewing Daniel, and you're saying, tell me more about what happened to John. Oh, he brought me my coochie, and what happened next, and he did this, and what happened after that, and he did that. What about Gabriella? John, John, John rubbed her too. Tell me more about that. Tell me what happened next. Tell me more about that. What happened after that? Tell me more. Daniela. Was Mary also rubbed by John? No. Gabriella, when you were downstairs in the basement, was Mary rubbed on her coochie by John? 
No. Now you got the referral, you got a concrete statement, but she keeps telling you no. Where's the linguistic breakdown here? What might be the explanation for that? Right. She thinks because the expectation is, is that the doer is at the beginning of the sentence, the question is interpreted by the five and a half year old as did Mary rub John's coochie? That Mary's the rubber and John's the object of the rubber. And the answer is no, and the answer is correct. It's 100% correct because we asked a bad question. We asked a question in the passive voice that was interpreted by a young child consistent with their development. And in their development, the person doing something is at the beginning, so Mary never rubbed Johnny, and not true, it didn't happen. Now listen, you don't need to be worried about these things in your forensic interview and thinking about exactly why. I don't know. The referral says that Mary was rubbed too. Wonder what's happening. Why is she denying? Why is she inconsistent? What the hell is going on here? Is this um, an active voice, passive voice? Is the kid being literal? Is this an agency problem? This, these are good things to know and important things to know. But I teach forensic interviewers, and I suggest to you, you don't need to figure out what the hell's going on. Just switch it up. Ask the question differently. Just switch it up. You don't need to identify, at least in the middle of the interview, hopefully if you watch it on video and you're doing peer review, you're looking at your work with your colleagues to get better at what you do, you might figure out that this was a active passive voice issue or something like that. But in real time, in the heat of the moment, when you're interviewing the child, you don't know what the hell's going on. With Clinton and the boxer brief dichotomy, with Mary and John and Gabrielle and Danielle and the boy in the basement, simply say, okay, so Mary, in your mind, you're so Mary, I asked her, was Mary rubbed by John? Well, did John do did John do the same thing with his hand to Mary? Uh-huh. Tell me more about that. Did John touch Mary? You may not even know that you flipped it around. But if you just change the way you ask the question, you may stumble upon clarity. And that's okay. Even the most polished interviewers have some thoughts about why this kid's not saying what they expected him to say, or saying things differently, but they don't always know the correct answer if they're there. The only ammunition they have is to say the question differently. Back up, switch it around a little, put some context on it. Tell me more about that, huh? Tell me what happened next, huh? Well, you said that you were in the shed, and Grandpa came and he was playing the shed game with you. And he, he told me that he put his hand on your wiener and did the tickle thing. What happened after he did the tickle thing? Where were you sitting, or where were you when he did the tickle thing? What part of the shed were you in? We calibrate things a little. Come through a different door that's open and as neutral and as objective as possible. And you may get to the answer that you've been seeking a different way, without knowing exactly what the heck's going on. This is the golden rule here, okay? The golden rule. Questions should be simple and concrete. They should not be complex or abstract. Be aware of words that seem simple but are not simple. Touch. Why, why does the word touch sometimes give kids problems? I'll give you a hint. Assume that the molest was an object molestation. That a person put a Lego block in the child's vagina or a toy. And it's an object, what we call an object penetration. And the child denied being touched. How might we explain that linguistically? There's a video of it. We know it happened. And the child says, Uncle Gerardo never touched me. Well, it's part of kids being literal, 
and the Lego touch there. And kids think of the word touch as something that is accomplished using what? Your hands. Now, for, even for basic forensic interviewers, this is stuff we know, but the average person doesn't know that. Words that seem simple are not. Clothes. You may have seen in your discussion board, I posted a like, Venn diagram of homonyms, homophones, and whatever other kind of wacky uh, descriptions of words that are spelled differently but pronounced the same, words that are spelled the same and pronounced the same but mean different things. I don't know. I posted it in between your first set of discussion board posts and your second set. And why is clothes, with that great hint, why is clothes a problem? Sometimes. Say it? Yeah, which is a, a homonym. What was that other word? Homophone or something? Homophone. I think all homonyms are homophone, but somehow, whatever it is, the bottom line is it's confusing for kids. And this one isn't even spelled the same, it's spelled differently, but sounds the same and means something different. We talked about house. You know, house, apartment, trailer, projects. These seem like simple concepts for kids, but they aren't necessarily. Negation. Think about negation for a moment. By negation, we mean negatives or contractions. Contractions which are involved well, negation. We're talking about a set of people that are developing. They're small children. They're developing. They're just beginning to acquire language. They think very concretely, very literally. They think in the active voice. They think in subject, verb, object. And then we throw in this thing that's shorthand for the opposite. Did it kind of means did you not? Would it? means would you not. Shouldn't means should you not. Right? You have these words that are kind of weird, man. They have an apostrophe in them. There's letters missing. And they mean something different than the root word did or would or should. They mean the opposite thing. Couldn't. You could not see. Couldn't. The root is would. You could see is quite different from you couldn't see. And in the context of questioning children, sometimes we don't know what the hell it means. They need to be avoided at all costs, these contractions. At all costs. Let me ask you this. Be on your toes. If there was a, a car accident outside, and that car, you know that group of statues out front here, old people are frozen in time, talking to one another, hanging out, there they are, white students, white plaster. Suppose the car crashed into them and they came tumbling down, and you saw it. You were walking by and saw the whole accident. Now you're in court. There's a big lawsuit about that. The family of all those crumpled statues is suing. You're on the witness stand. And someone asks you, now you saw it. The question is, Didn't you not see the accident that happened outside? What's the answer? There's two negatives in there, right? Did you not not see the accident outside? I'll change it around. You couldn't see the accident outside, could you? And if you did, what's the answer? Yes or no? Is the answer yes or no? You couldn't see the accident outside, could you? The answer is yes. No. The answer is no. The answer is no. You couldn't see the accident outside, could you? You couldn't see the accident outside. Well, I saw it. If you say no, that corrects their, their assertion that you couldn't see the accident. But you see what I'm talking about? It's not that easy. To, what's that? That's suggestive, and it's not, it's not true. Well, forgetting about the suggestion, you're correct, it is suggestive. But the defense lawyer is asking that question. He's allowed to ask suggestive, we say. 
I'm offering that as an example of complex negation. If we break it down, you couldn't see the accident, could you? You couldn't. Couldn't means could not, right? You could not see the accident. Could you? That could you really messes things up. We'll get rid of could you. You could not see the you couldn't see the accident. From where you were standing, you couldn't see the accident. From where I'm standing, I could not see the accident. You know, these kids are beginning to develop and acquire language, and to do that kind of analysis uh, is too taxing. And maybe you get a right answer, maybe you get a wrong answer. I suggest to you, you always get a suspect answer. By a suspect answer, I'm not so sure I trust it, because I'm not so sure what the hell they're answering. I'm not so sure that we grown-ups know exactly how to do the mathematics of a complex negation equation. You couldn't see that Susie wasn't wearing her shirt. Let's say that Danielle could see Susie topless. She was there, she saw it with her own eyes, and Susie had no shirt on. You couldn't see that Susie wasn't wearing her shirt. What's, what's the child say? What's the right answer? If she actually saw the topless Susie. You couldn't see that Susie wasn't wearing her shirt. The answer is no, I think. Right? Or is it yes? Yes, I couldn't see. No, I could see. So she couldn't see. Avoid these things, okay? Isn't Sam Susie's uncle? Is not Sam Susie's uncle? Expressions of time, speed, size, and duration. These are what I call, I think Rafa Walker calls them comparatives. Comparatives. And they only really have meaning when you compare them to something else. As a Amateur photographer, you learn right away that if you're by a great redwood tree out in California and you take a picture of it with your camera, it has no meaning until you have somebody stand next to it, or better yet, drive your car next to the great redwood. You see, size, duration, speed, words that characterize these things have no meaning unless they're compared to someone else. What did the man look like who broke in the house? He was big. Well, what does that mean? Big compared to what? How big is big? I'm big compared to some guys. Shaquille O'Neal's big. I'm a little guy compared to Shaquille O'Neal. He's seven foot four, three fifty. Probably seven foot four, four fifty now because he's retired. But in any event, I stand next to Shaq. And he's a giant. Believe it or not, if Shaq stood next to poor departed Andre the Giant, the wrestler, he'd be small. My new bowl was seven foot eight or something. All of them stand next to a jumbo jet, they're little. The point is, all of this stuff is relative. And if a child simply says he was old or young or tall or short or big or small, that's not enough. You need a point of comparison. You need a point of comparison. These are vague and ambiguous words. Fast. Now, we adults, if you say a car was driving fast, okay? We can get away with that sometimes because we have life experience and we know what the speed limit is. We know what generally cars do on side streets and on county roads and what they do on the parkway or the turnpike. You know, if somebody goes, that car was driving really fast, I think we can assume they were doing over 65 and they're probably doing 90 or 100. It could be 150. Who knows? I don't know what really fast means, but I know what it's not. So we can begin to infer things because we have life experience. When we asked a kid, was he old or young? He was old. Uh, we all know that. I mean, the kids. Old as a teenager. Somebody in his eighth grade to a fourth grader. So you got to avoid these words. You have to be precise. You have to use comparatives. How might you ask a child about height? Supposing it's a stranger abduction or one of these luring cases that seems to be happening in northern New Jersey right now, since so we're Bergen County only, but child says eight years old, the man came and tried to put me in the car. Tell me what he looked like. Tell me everything about him. Tell me what he was wearing. Tell me about his face. Okay, you'd be very general. Tell me about his body. 
How tall was he? Beep. Yeah, use something that's known, right? So how might you ask that question? First of all, you see how Fran was in the interview, right? What would she have to do immediately if you were going to use yourself as a comparator? Stand up. Stand up. Tell me the question you'd ask. Let's go. Is she taller than me? Was she taller than me or shorter than me? Okay. How much taller than me? Or? Was she taller than your mom? If there's a dad, yeah. Your dad, I, your dad is sitting outside waiting for us in this interview. Could you use the floor? Is she? You could. You could use anything that's distinct. Is she tall? Was he taller than dad or shorter than dad? A lot taller than dad. Okay, we know how tall dad is. We can bring dad in the in the interrogation room, and I can measure him. So now I know what we're looking for here. Again, with comparatives. Even old and young. It doesn't matter age number. If I, if, if you, you know, you have, a, was he older than mommy or younger than mommy? Okay. Whether he in fact was older than mommy isn't important. To that child, the person appeared older than mommy. What, what made you say that? You know, well, he had gray hair, he was bald or whatever. I could be bald than 22, so her, 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 what influenced her might be erroneous. That's not helpful, uh, bald. We need to know more. But simply asking questions about relational expressions of time, speed, size, and duration are not. I think there's a video about that. We'll look at it in a minute. Kinship terms. What do kinship terms remind you of? that I talked about earlier. They're vague and imprecise and can always be replaced. Pronouns. A kinship term is just another kind of pronoun. Okay? It's a, it's a substitute for someone else or something else. It's a person. Kinship term is always a person. Right? Grandma, aunt, cousin, brother. Kids have multiple grandmas. They might have more than two grandmas, believe it or not. Right. Many cousins. Excuse me. More than one aunt. You need to name them and use the term that describes the person. Use names, not pronouns. We teach with number. We don't need to know the precise number. Because kids can't give us the precise number. We looked at that chart a couple weeks ago. Once or more than once. I think I told you all about that. We ask kids whether it happened once or more than once. And that's enough for our purposes. If the kid calls, like, instead of grandma, nanny, for instance, but you would make that clear that that's her name instead of, you know, the, most children don't know that nanny's name is, like, Cindy, you know what I mean? Is that concrete enough for Because you have to have well, yeah, if, if you're going to do in the protocol I show you, and whatever protocol you're using, you need to identify people. And if you call them nanny, and you, I would try to find out more about it. What does mommy call nanny? nanny she, calls, she, she calls her uh, great nanny, or, or nanny Abigail. Is it okay if we call her? Not is it okay. I'm going to call her nanny Abigail, okay, or whatever. But you, you, need, you need to be precise. And clearly, if there's only one nanny in the equation, and in the interview, it, it's a lot less likely to create a problem. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is where there's an opportunity for a proper name or a more descriptive name, use that. It may not be there and it may not even be an issue. We're just talking about Nanny, Nanny's house, Nanny this, Nanny that, you can call her Nanny. But if she if she calls her Big Nanny, call her Big Nanny. If she calls her Nanny and she use, Mommy calls her something else, Nanny Abigail, call her Nanny Abigail. This way, if there ever is a potential for conflict, if there ever is some other relative at the house, you're precise. Stronger or bigger are, again, comparatives. You need to compare them to something to have any meaning. This is about the variability of children. You know, we looked at that chart, but even adolescents may have the same kinds of language skills of school-age children if they're undereducated, underparented, unattached, or developmentally disabled. So some of the same things I'm 
offering to you about children and language can be problems with teenagers, or even seven or eight or nine or ten year olds if they're developmentally disabled, if they're underparented, if they don't have a lot of language. Kids who grow up in language rich households have a lot of language. Kids who are ignored and shunned and not dealt with by their caregivers have less language, typically. Kids who read or are read to have more language than kids who aren't read to or don't. Makes sense. So, you know, if you have kids that are underparented or undereducated or developmentally disabled, they may not have the kinds of skills the average nine-year-old has. So you may need to be paying attention to the same things I talked about, which really apply to basically seven and under. And preschoolers are most vulnerable to mistakes of literalism and mistakes of active passive voice and all the things we talked about. You know, that 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 kind of stuff is about seven and under. But you can find ten year olds who may have problems with that. And it's never wrong to be simple and concrete. Never. Even when interviewing adult witnesses. You know, I'm a member of law enforcement. I encourage my detectives to follow the same rules when you're talking with an adult witness. Pronouns and their imprecision infects all kinds of writing and all kinds of documentation and communication. If I read a report from a detective and there's a lot of pronouns in there and I gotta draw it with a pencil and go backwards in time and try to figure out who the hell he's talking about, that's never good. So I, I use these kind of strategies with everybody I talk to, no matter what. However, this slide makes the observation that these kinds of problems can happen even with older kids. Words like always and never, any and ever, they, they, they can be problems in this sense. Some kids, not all of them, but if you ask a kid, well, you told me that you know, Grandpa would come in your room and put his hand in his mouth on your tachi. And your tachi is that part there you showed me? Yeah. Did Grandpa ever come in a different room and touch you on your tachi? Some kids will respond no to that. Not because the answer is no, but because they, they have a tough time with the word ever and never. These are absolutes. And linguists like Ann Walker argue that these kinds of questions call for what they describe as a global memory search. And that means, you know what, I need to check every possibility there ever was. And that's so much work and too hard, my little brain does not have the ability to do that global search, so I'm going to give you a no, it's just easier. They're beginning to learn language, and ever is like eternity, ever. Never. That's a lot of work. You know, you ever try to search your whole computer for something and you, you put in a word and there's you got a billion files on there and search, you know, your email, you search for email, it just crashes. You're asking the computer to do a global memory search and it's just easier to crash than to do it because it requires a lot of effort, taxing. And because children are so literal, we talked about that, they, they kind of they kind of circle these words very literally, some of them. And it's like, wow, ever? Jeez, i got to analyze from the moment I have cognizance, from the moment I was aware of my existence, to right now. So Walker says to avoid those words. Did he come in your room on a different time? You told me everything about him doing it in your bedroom. Did he do this in a different room on another day, on a different day? Don't ask words we never never. Too global. Before and after are problematic. You've got to try to avoid that. The word forget is a little bit charged. You've got to be careful with those kind of questions. And we have to watch our language when we use these kinds of jargon and, and figures of speech. Okay? Visiting relatives, were you visiting relatives, might be a little confusing. Did you go over grandma's house that weekend? 
You know, that's something we say to adults and we say all the time. And the question asks, where did you go to grandma's house? But in English language, we sometimes say, did you go over to grandma's house after you came home from the shore? Or after you came home from the shore, did you go over to grandma's house? Now, these kids are real literal. They're, they're going to they're interpret it as what? And the answer is going to be no. I didn't go over to grandma's house. Because how are they interpreting that? Yeah, they're on a broom, or they're flying, or they're walking, or who knows? That are we literally over there? So they're very literal. You got to watch some of these figures of speech, and you can't even predict them. Um, that we say time and again, and that are easily understood by adults, can be confusing to kids. Do you remember? I talked at length about that. Um, a multisyllabic words problem. This really is keep it simple and concrete. So that would get rid of proceeding unintentional, accidental, demonstrate, deliberately, multiple. This is more about suggestibility. We'll talk about that in the next section. Grandpa kisses you, doesn't he? We call that a tag question because there's a tag at the end. And it's a bad question, it's a misleading question, it's a suggestive question. And essentially what happens is the interviewer makes a statement and asks if you agree with it. That's not good interview. It's highly suggestive. And the tag is, did he, doesn't he, didn't she, isn't that true? Pronouns, I told you about those before, you know how I feel about them. Here's a perfect example. I saw John and Max touching. He had a big one. All right, who's he? Prepositions can be problems for children. That's why we use anatomical dolls sometimes, because they help kids express what cannot be expressed with words. And we'll learn more about that later. Time concepts. I think we talked a little bit about that last week. Did I tell you how I used to talk to Daniel about time? Maybe not. I've been in so many trainings and forensic interviewing things over the past few weeks. When kids are five and four, preschoolers, and even up to seven and eight, you know, yesterday, tomorrow, next week, they're just beginning to understand time, chronology, sequence. So you have to be careful when you question kids about these things. You've got to kind of keep it general because you're not going to get precision. Last week or ten days ago, tomorrow are very difficult concepts for preschoolers and even some older kids. And one way I used to try to find out or communicate with my son Daniel when he was like seven, even younger, five or six, and he'd be like, how much longer to grandma's house? I told him a half hour, an hour, an hour and 20 minutes. It had no meaning. I could say that, but then he probably would be quiet and I'd go on driving. However, what I used to say was, in two and a half Doras, or one Dora, because she liked Dora Explorer. Dora was a, was a half hour show. So that was concrete to him. That had meaning to him. That was relevant to him. That that was um, an expression of time that he understood and I understood. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's all what it's all about with language. We need for two humans to stand across from one another. And if one person says something and the other person understands it, that's communication. Mutual understanding. He knew what I meant. And I knew what he, or what he understood. So anyway, those are the kinds of things that you know I, I'm able to do that because I know what he watches and things like that. But you know, you could you could use those kind of strategies if that kind of precision was needed. You know, was it as long as a class in school? Was it as long as preschool? I, I don't know what it is. You'd have to know for a particular child. But you can use something that's known to them with regard to time or duration that might be helpful and expressing what happened. You want to avoid sudden topic shifts and sudden time shifts. Alice Greenwood, who used to help us with this project, Finding Words, some years ago, was a linguist from Montclair State and later Long Island Jewish Medical Center College out there. She used to say, think of them as chapter headings. So when you're interviewing a child, you need to put chapter headings on what we're talking about. 
what I mean by that is this. The time in the shed. The time in the bedroom. The time in the back of 7-Eleven. Excuse me. And what you don't want to do is jump around from the shed to the 7-Eleven, to the truck, to the bedroom. Well, you told me, Gerardo, about something that happened in the car and back of 7-Eleven. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. You've told me a lot of things about the time in the 7-Eleven drawer in the back of the truck. Now I want to talk about the time in the shed. You introduce the next chapter heading and you stay on that. Don't jump back and forth. Because it can be confusing. And they may be answering a question about the shed when you asked about the back of the car. And simply because you're hopping around chronologically, you've created confusion. And we want to avoid confusion. Why questions. We talked about why with regard to motivation, that kids have a tough time understanding the motivations of others and even their own motivations, why they did something. Well, there's another way that we ask why questions. That is, why did you do something or why did you not do something? And we do that with kids a lot. We need to avoid that. One of the classic questions is, why did you tell mom? Why did you call out to somebody? Why did you go in the room? You know, we had a little girl who was molested during the, the, the chess. She was in an after-school program for chess. And the guy would give her extra help. And the one time, she was nine or ten, but so she was pretty confident and able to give a narrative and all that. She tells the story about how this offensive um, thing happened. She was molested by herself in a classroom during a private chess session of some sort. And then she explains further that, you know, about a week later, he asked her if she wanted extra help in chess. And she said yes. And he said, well, you have to meet me in that same classroom after school, I'll give you extra help. And she's okay, I'll be there. And she went there. You know, so she might have been a little older, though. She might have even been a little bit older. I'm not sure, but she wasn't a little kid. She might have even been 12 or 13 or whatever. So what's the obvious question jurors want to know? The rather obvious question is why? Yeah, why she went back? See, most of our cases involve a situation where the child is stuck. They live in a house, or they stay over grandma's, or they're being babysat, the babysitter's son molests them. There's no way out, right? They're, they're not going there. Well, they live there. You know, this was something where a simple no, I don't need any extra help in chess, would have eliminated the potential for this to happen again. Now, she might have been scared of him, she might, but all those things might have been the case. So, although... We don't like to ask kids, why did they tell? We know that kids don't tell right away. We know that it's irrelevant as a matter of law, whether they told or not, at or about the time. But sometimes the question is so important and so out there that it needs to be asked, right? You've got a kid who's older, this was a negative. To what happened? It was terrible. No. Changing the facts a little, but soon she goes, it's terrible. It took me. Hey, maybe do this. Then when I met him to death, it was disgusting. Okay. And what happened? What happened next? Well, about a week later, he asked me if I need to chest out. What did you say? I said, yeah. And then what happened next? He said, you got to meet me after class. Did you go? Yeah, I went. Was he there? No, he wasn't there. So I went and found him. Okay. You know, well, what about that? You know, you can't not ask that question. Now, how do you ask that? That's the question. You know, you want to try to avoid the why. If you need to know why, why can be what? How do people perceive why, even if it needs to be asked? Judgmental, right? What else about why? How else does it make people feel? You're judging them? How else if I say <coughs> Accusatory, guilty, <coughs> excellent. It's judgmental, it's accusatory, they feel guilty. When you say, well, why would you go in the yard in a rainstorm and, and, and the dog got hit by lightning? Why would you do that? Well, 
the message is you were stupid, man. Who goes in the yard in a great lightning storm? Well, you know, why is it accusatory? It's judgmental. It suggests they did something wrong. But sometimes you need to know the answer, like my chest example. So we recommend that you say, was there a reason that you went back? Is there a reason that you went to look for him? Is there a reason that, you no, know, you said the first time it was really scary and you did disgusting things. Is there a reason you went back the second time? That's a, listen, we're here not only to find out if some kids were abused, we're here to rule out abuse. If there's some BS about this assertion, now, we can't be like many persons in law enforcement years ago who were skeptical of every woman and child who makes a statement. No. We need to accept what people say and, and, and analyze it professionally. But if there are some glaring issues in your case, like the chess example, you need to follow up on that. Well, you know, she probably meant this or she probably meant that. No, probably. Ask her. But ask it in a different way. Is there a reason you went back? Was there a reason you went back? Is there something that made you go back? So what if, what if the answer to that was, yeah, I wanted help with Jeff? Well. Then what would you say? Like, well, then, then I'm not sure. That's a good, I, I don't know that I've ever seen that, but if they said that, you know, well, you, you, you might want to follow up and say, well, you said the first time you did all these really disgusting things. Did that cross your mind that that might happen again? Did that something that you sold it to? You know? Well, I, I thought he would only do it once. I don't know. We might find out. It's still a question that needs to be followed up on. So it may, as I'm thinking out loud here, it may bear well. I understand that. You want to help with chess, but you told me that it was really disgusting the first time. And he did all these terrible things, and then he, he went there again. And did you think that, that he might do those things again? Well, he promised never to do it again. Okay, I covered another fact. Or I, I, I was going to leave the door open because I really love chess. The bottom line is, I think we need to know that answer. Because a fact finder, this is forensic interviewing. Okay? It's not child protection, it's forensic interviewing. And forensic interviewing assumes that this will wind up illegal. And when there's some glaring question about what happened, that needs to be asked and answered. And a little bit different issue here. I'm getting the, the whole thing here is how to ask why differently, not confused for it. But yeah, following up on that, I think that's something that requires. Uh, follow up. And if you got an answer like that, you keep follow up. And if you don't get it sound satisfactory, then you can move on. I mean, it's, it is what it is. Anything else? Because it's forensic interviewing, we need to avoid words like play and pretend and story. And, you know, when you're talking to little kids, sometimes it's not that easy to do. You might say, well, listen, Tell me the story of what happened when Grandpa brought you in the shed. The story suggests fantasy, stuff that's made up. And even though you might not have meant that, or clearly didn't mean that, you don't want to inject words that are related to fantasy into a forensic interview. You need to avoid that. You'll see when I show you anatomical dolls later in the course, even though we want the child to demonstrate with a doll that represents them and a doll that represents Uncle Gerard. We don't want to say, well, pretend this doll is Uncle Gerard and pretend this doll is you. These are just little things that go a long way when you become a competent and experienced forensic interviewer. We get rid of words that imply fantasy. Last thing we want with a little kid is to invite fantasy. Right? So an easy way to do that is avoid fantastic or words that invite fantasy. Here's the thing that I'm a big fan of, and it's not that um, it's not that obvious uh, that this is a problem in forensic interviews or any kind of interview. But Ann Walker talks about in your readings about the use of any, and for whatever reasons. When we ask a question that has a form of the word anything, did anything come out? Was anyone there? Did he come in your room any time, any other time? 
Did he have anything in his pocket? Whatever. Getting about the suggestibility of my questions. When you ask a question involving any, research has shown repeatedly that it calls for a negative response or a no, even if the opposite is true. And the classic example is in your readings. Jillian, did you have anything for lunch today? A, a response you may see is, no, just a bagel and some cottage cheese. Well, the answer to no is wrong, right? The answer is yes, just a bagel and cottage cheese. But for whatever reason, when you ask a word that has a conjugation of the word any, anything, anyone, anyhow, anywhere, it pulls for the word, the response, no. Not always. Perhaps in most cases, the person answers it legitimately and accurately. Nevertheless, research has shown that in some cases, with some kids, they answer no, when in fact the answer is yes. My example is, did you have anything for lunch? No, just a bagel. It's not, it's not true. It's, it's yes, just a bagel. If you said, Jillian, did you have something for lunch today? She's going to say yes. She's not going to say no. And linguists have learned that any pulls for negativity or no, they, they call it, they, they characterize it with this fancy description. The word any has negative polarity. And, and I think the metaphor there is you know, like the North Pole and the South Pole? Well, poles, poles are opposites. So yes is one pole, and no is the other pole, and in between is all other kinds of agreements, consensus, and consent. But yes and no, <coughs> these are the poles. Negative polarity pulls towards the no pole. <coughs> so the answer to that is, how do you do that? You know, is it a one in a million thing? Who knows? But asking... Did anything come out is more potentially problematic than did something come out. Was anyone else in the basement when Johnny rubbed Mary? Was someone else in the basement when Johnny rubbed Mary? Every any conjugation you can replace with a some conjugation. Is there anything else you want to tell me, Danielle? Is there something else you want to tell me? Something's more neutral and more likely to pull for an accurate answer while anything pulls for a negative answer. Sophisticated stuff. You know, I mean, I watched dozens of interviews in Minneapolis-St. Paul. I've heard any a million times. I've seen no one doing what I'm recommending. I do it because it's one of my pet little things that I'm always vigilant about. And at the end of the day, you know, the payoff is a little. But it's something, like I said, it's the little thing. Don't use pronouns. Speak in the active voice. Be concrete. Use something instead of anything. Don't avoid sudden topic shifts. Right? All these little things build on one another, and you're going to get better information at the end of the day. There's no doubt about it. They may be little things in and of themselves, but in the aggregate, they help you get more information and higher quality information, and it is respectful of the child's linguistic development. And you're less likely to undermine that child's credibility by speaking at their level. Check for child's definition. This is a very forensic interview type uh, reminder even for things you think you know the answer to. For example, this one's easy. Even an inexperienced forensic interviewer knows what they ask next year. Uncle Gerardo came in my room. Where was Mommy? She was in her room. Was someone else in the room? No, it was just me. What happened next? Uncle Gerardo crawled into bed with me. What happened next? He started to get nasty with me. Tell me what happened next. Then he kissed me. Well, Daniela, you told me Uncle Gerardo got nasty with you. I don't know what nasty means. Lots of kids have different meanings for nasty. Well, you tell me what nasty means. That's called check for definition. But even more specifically, Uncle 
Uncle Gerardo took me in the truck in the back of 7-Eleven. What happened? First he started to go down on me, and then he put his mouth on my mouth, and he made me put my mouth on his wiener. Well, you can assume that going down on her meant he performed oral sex on her. And first of all, that's age-inappropriate characterization, which is good, and because it shows that she has an awareness of sexual terminology that's beyond her developmental level. And that's a good thing when you want to prove that this really happened. But more importantly, I don't know what going down on her. I know what I think going down on somebody means. I know what it means in common slang. But do you know what it means? No. Well, they know you said that Gerardo went down on you in a truck. What does it mean to go down on someone? What did he do? What happened next? What did he do with his body? Check for definition. And this happens with, got fresh with me, got nasty, went down on me, told me that I gave him a head. Whatever kind of description that they give that is vague, you need to follow up on. And even if it in slang is clear to you, you don't know if their use of the slang is consistent with your understanding. So you need to always check for definition. Does that make sense? Huh? Yeah. Ah. This is what we talked about in the discussion forum, right? Use age-appropriate words. Children translate an unfamiliar term for a familiar term. Jury becomes jewelry. Common in error. A court can be somewhere you play basketball, or a court can be somewhere there are legal proceedings, right? A hearing. A hearing is what happens in a courtroom, or it could be something they do with their ears. Now, they may not understand the legal definition. They may only understand the common definition. So we need to be vigilant in our use of words, especially homonyms and things like that. Uh, we found many auditory discrimination errors in your discussion forums, right? When you interviewed your kids, you found some, perhaps? Certainly your colleagues found some. You read the discussion postings of your colleagues. You saw the spreadsheet I put together with the class last semester that had all kinds of responses. So this is something that's real. This is not something Grafon Walker cooked up in the laboratory, right? It's very real how kids interpret words and make these auditory discrimination errors. Now, Alice Greenwood, I told you about the other language to work with us, she tells a story about uh, when she was in Manhattan and her husband's overcoat was stolen. Did I ever tell you that story? Good. So that's an example of an auditory discrimination error. And one thing I like about the Family Circle cartoons that I selected for your perspective F, F10, F11. These are very... I think they're very good examples of what we're talking about, right? I don't know if you can see that there. The, the, they, they might be made from the same thing, but cotton candy tastes better than my shirt. What's the root of the problem there? What word and what kind of linguistic issue in the first one? Common. And what is that? A hominid. But it's a hominid. <laughs> You're being very literal. You're being very literal. Very good. The example being very literal. It is a material. But in this case, it's a hominid. The word's cotton. Right? Grandma, this chili you made isn't chili at all. Right? Again, I think it's a homophone error or maybe a homonym error, but it's it's a word that's pronounced the same, although spelled differently. Okay? Mine's exactly like yours. It's an ice cream clone. Right? But there's, there's even more clever on another level, right? Because it's exactly the same clone. The clone is a, a, a completely identical thing shared in DNA. Um, but again, that, that seems to be what kind of error? An auditory discrimination error, right? 
Watch my step. But mommy, I'm sitting down. Okay? Give me, when I just was giving you the lecture a moment ago with the PowerPoints, what is this similar to? This boy's statement. I gave you an example of something that was confusing. And, and we adults use these kind of statements, but kids take them very literal. What's that example of? A figure of? I, I said they, we go over to grandma's house. You know, watch your step. It's a figure of speech, right? Now, all figures of speech, if you really, that's why I like that show about the way about words. If, if you think about it, no one really thinks about what watch your step means anymore. But its derivation probably is, it's, it's to be careful, it's almost to be careful in a punitive way. You better be careful or something bad is going to happen. You're going to get in trouble. Okay? So, I suspect watch your step arose as a figure of speech throughout the generations about, you know, you got to keep pay attention where you're walking. You fall off a cliff, you fall off a story, you get hit by a car. Okay? However, on a literal level, that's the other aspect of it, I guess it's literal. And that's the way kids have problems with grandma's, are you going over grandma's house? They take it literally. No. He's taking it literally like, actually it's different than I thought. He's saying, I'm sitting down, I'm not even stepping. But we mean it to be careful what you say to me or watch your stepwise guy or behave. I think typically a parent means to behave when they say watch your step. I think. I don't know the context here. But another kid might interpret that as you need to go out and sit by the stairs right, and watch them. Here's one that speaks right to chronology and sequence and all that stuff and Daniel's two doors. Why, why is it never tomorrow, Mommy? Every time I wake up, it's today again. And you know, kind of profound and metaphysical, but you know, he's just he's a little kid. He doesn't really get it. You know, tomorrow's never here because when I start, when I get to tomorrow, it's today. And I think it speaks to the fact that little kids really are beginning to appreciate time, sequence, chronology, duration. You know, the passage of moment to moment to moment is something that they're pondering, but don't have a complete grasp of. That's right. Exactly. Now, I didn't go over Walker's article here, but there's some things here. You better familiarize yourself with it because it will be on the midterm. Okay? Ahead of, behind, any. Here's that any I just went over with you, the negative polarity. Um, here's the word. Right there, negative polarity. Ask and tell before and after, big, different, and same, forgetting. Now, any questions about this segment of your uh, semester, learning unit three? Because we're done with it. Some of it you did on your own, some of it I talked about this evening. Did everyone here, I haven't checked, so did everyone here take the practice exam? Yes, is there someone who, see, not anyone, someone. Is there someone who did not? Are you going to do it between now and next week? Yes. Yeah, because I want to make sure, it's not an exam, I just want to make sure you, unless you've taken a blackboard exam before, then it doesn't matter. It's a practice midterm. I think it's three, four questions. It's just no, no. It's just like you know. Yeah, it's, it's a joke. It's just a way to learn, teach you how to click around. Check it out. You'll get a hundred. Well, you might get a hundred. That's not what's relevant. I watched something where you talk through like this is an example of the test. This is what you 
Yeah, there's a video about it too, but there's also a practice exam. Didn't I post the practice exam? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's there. Look up the exam. Yeah, yeah, it's four. It's just about. No, there's no study guides. Uh, your, the study guide are your lessons. Um, but this isn't the exam. This is a, four questions to teach you how to. You're going to take it in class. I think it's October 30th. And you're going to sit at a computer, and I want you to get familiar with putting the password in, all caps, MSU space NJ, clicking around, the form of the questions. It takes 30 seconds. Learning units one through four. <laughs> you know, I've told you that, and I told you at the beginning of the semester. Um, look, look at the chapter headings, right? If you look on Blackboard, see the learning objectives. I didn't write that just for the heck of it. I wrote it because. My hope is, is at the end of this learning unit, that's what you'll learn. You'll understand the linguistic implications of forensic interviewing. Well, you just spent the day on linguistic implications of forensic interviewing. You'll appreciate common linguistic errors. You should be able to name three of them immediately. Auditory discrimination error, a homonym error, you know, uh, whatever the other errors are. You know, and, and leveraging your understanding is what I said before. Every one of these little things... It helps you do a better interview. So if you use someone to anyone, you are aware that kids can be literal, you use the active voice, you don't jump, shift, jump, and shift topics. All these things in the aggregate help you do a better interview. And that's what I mean by the ability to leverage your understanding. And um, you know, I, I think there's also, on the learning unit pages, there's a little description of what the what's going on here. Section one, there's a whole giant paragraph on suggestibility, there's a whole... Okay? So I would focus on those things. Those are the... Those are the that's your study guide. That's the key to focusing on what I'm focusing on. What I'm going to ask about. Any other questions? Okay, that concludes tonight's session, 10-16-2012.